Hi, everybody. Welcome to the new and improved Fundamentalists <laughs> podcast. We're coming at you live from 2021, not a moment too soon. My name is Elliot Morgan, and I'm here with one of my best friends in the world, Dr. Peter Rollins from Northern Ireland. He is a blah, 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 and I am also a blah, 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 blah. blah. and I do things on blah, 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 and he writes things that are blah, 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 and you can find out more at patreon.com slash Peter Rollins, or uh, patreon.com slash the Valley Folk. Uh, we did an episode on kind of what we're talking about today already. We did it. Um, let me make sure my vocal. Yeah, uh, we did it on kind of uh, a loosey goosey episode. But I was in the midst of writing term papers and getting my stuff done, and we did it over Zoom. And we talked about it afterward, and we decided, hey, you know what? We can do it better. Let's take some time off, enjoy the holidays, and then recuperate. And we're back in action now because it was it was actually quite a good one but we did think we could do better our standards i think are probably too high too high (laughs) for what we do yes but it does i was talking about this earlier it's like we do weirdly quality check each episode yeah like we are um whole foods or something we really Mm -hmm. make sure or uh what, what, what what's something that quality checks things a quality checker a quali- we're like quality checkers. Yeah. Uh, that's very good. And so we, we go through and we, we assess afterward a little bit on whether or not it's worthy of being uploaded. And uh, a if- few, only a few, but a few have hit the cutting room floor. Uh-huh. Uh, now, the reason why I liked it was because you were quoting from one of the books you were reading. You were talking yes. about your essay that you were writing. Right. And then we got into all of this discussion about what can you know and how can you know and is there such yeah. a thing as a Western mind and Eastern mind? Yes. It was all very interesting, but uh, we're also doing it remotely. Doing it remotely. And, and my oh, headphones played up. Really? Uh, yeah. So. Well, we'll blame the tools, the craftsmen. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think it was great because you were, you were uh, coming at me. I you, was feisty. I was you were feisty. feisty, but yeah. I was like, wait a minute. I think you're feisty for things that we we're agreeing on because uh, I yeah. didn't give context, I don't think, but I could be wrong there. So we're going to mm. talk a little bit today about epistemology. Um, if you've seen, if you're seeing this on youtube.com slash Elliot Morgan, which is where you can see the video versions of this, the thumbnail might say something along the lines of knowledge or how we learn things. If we can't even know anything, what is the deal with knowing things? Yeah. Can we Or are Mm -hmm. they just ideas in our heads that have been bred into us from like, quote, society? Or like, is it like, because we like learn because it's nurture versus like all that stuff. And what's to say we're not all living in a simulation? How do we know anything to be objectively true? Um, You like to, you see, you slip that one in because you love aliens and you love we all live in a simulation. I, you, that was more like 2018 I mean, Elliot Morgan. I know. 2017 Elliot Morgan. But, yeah. but yeah. if there's one thing I know about Elliot Morgan, he'll cycle back. He'll come back to the, <laughs> That's the, a nice call the back. years ago ideas. <laughs> um, but I, I'm interested to talk about this because it is one of those things that is, it is philosophical. Like this is as philosophical, I think, it as is. you can get of a subject matter because it is based this is what you do yeah like this is your area of expertise it's one of the most basic basic as not easiest but most basic questions in philosophy is what can we know how can we know what's the relationship between knowledge and being so what is the relationship if anything between what's going on in my head and what's going on in reality or what is reality <laughs> nothing so, yep. if anything very little if anything, <laughs> i would say yeah. um so i'm assuming you've you've thought about this a little bit are you got new slippers yeah I, you know what i bought i got these for like 10 bucks and they're john ververos they i was in their outlet store i like ververos nice. and they had 70 percent off 50 percent off and this per da, 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 da. And then in other go. words apocalypse time uh, the, yeah. the shops i guess are just 50 percent off 70 percent off and then the peat shelf right under, yeah under that. <laughs> i'm worried i think what should happen now is that small businesses should just give all of their money directly to jeff bezos because uh, i think they're all struggling yeah and they're all dying except for the bastards well <laughs> that's a different podcast yeah, but you're okay. probably right i love that your palette of color right here you vary between black and gray yeah i'm colorblind so this means i don't clash for the podcast if i that's if i good. if i ever introduce colors into my wardrobe you, who knows what i would look like well pete how do you know you're colorblind yeah Wow, look at that. That's good. See that? That was fun. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what do you, what, yeah, but how, yeah. where do we begin we're with no, with the idea of knowing that you can know anything? Well, so this came up because you were quoting out of a book 
um, an interesting book, but it came up with this notion of the Western mind. And my initial thought was, okay, is there such a thing as a Western mind? Uh, as opposed to, say, an Eastern mind? Because then, you know, if there is, you could maybe talk about, you know, a male mind or a working class mind or a European mind. Sure. Or, and there, there are some people who think that knowledge can all be reduced to a sociology of knowledge. As in knowledge arises mm -hmm. from society, it reflects where we come from, our age, our wealth, it reflects our prejudices, just our desires. just a bundle of culturally imprinted upon ideas that you think are your own, but are actually, you wouldn't have any of those ideas had you not been born at the time and place in which yes. you were born. If we'd been born idea. somewhere else, yeah, if we'd been born at a different time, different place, we'd believe in different gods, we'd have different ideas. So basically our beliefs are contingent, they're relative to our positions, they're particularistic, and they don't have any connection to what's called the universal, right? We, so our beliefs are a reflection of our upbringing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also of our biology. Right. And that's probably, uh, that, that is a bad way to think. I agree. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's very popular. I, you notice it all the time. And, and so... The, that, Would you say it's all wrong? No, that's very true. Because knowledge has to arise from a sociology of knowledge. Like knowledge arises out of a particularistic context. It arises out of the books we read, the language we have, all of the, the, the inputs. Ugh. So it's just whether it's reducible to that because it definitely arises from it. Pete, I'm so bummed. I'm, I missed you so much. We've been apart for like two and a half <laughs> what two and a half weeks or something it's not okay it's so yeah. nice it's yeah. just nice to hear you talk about all this stuff <laughs> <laughs> it's so pleasant I'm like yeah. yeah what else what is it uh so okay yes yeah. yeah, so you you arise out of it with your cultural uh in your within your cultural milieu is that the right word yep and then you can then either go well, I guess I can't know anything because I'm just born. I'm born in the West, and the West is uh, scientifically oriented, and therefore this, and so all blah blah blah. And there, but any idea I have is is it kind of is a little self defeating, right? Like if you start yeah. thinking that everything you think, uh, you lose agency over yourself. I guess. Yeah, that, that's why, like in philosophy, often where you start with people. Is with the rel is with relativism. You kind of start by going like, "What if we can't know anything?" And then, of course, the first thing you ask is, "Well, the idea that we can't know anything is that true or false?" So if you go, "Well, the the idea that everything's relative is itself relative. I only believe in relativism because of how I was brought sure. up." Then it undermines itself, so it's not a claim to truth. Mm -hmm. uh, but if it is, a you can't be agnostic because you can't know that you don't know because that implies that you can know something. So, like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've read books ten years ago, <laughs> yeah. but that, that's yeah. kind of the same thing, right? It's like the the relativism. You go, okay, if I know some, if relativism is a relativist, relativism yeah. is an idea that came about because of your cultural upbringing, then. I don't know why I hate saying the word milieu because I think I'm pronouncing it wrong and it sounds silly when I say it. But yeah. like, okay, so I'm following. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. So if it's all of that, then you can't have any confidence in it. It's just, it's just like saying, right. you know, I like the color blue. It's not making just any like claim it. to truth. But if you think it's true, if you think that everything is relative, actually claims some sort of uh, truth value, has some sort of truth value, then it undermines itself. So, I mean, that's a very big, but that's where, you know, if you're in a philosophy class, that's a good way to introduce philosophy. It's going to go, okay, what do we do with this? Um, and then you realize that you've got one truth claim, which is the claim that you don't believe there's any truth. Mm -hmm. go, okay, there's one. But of course, that's not very much. You want to get a lot further than that. Yeah. Um, but the question is, how does knowledge of the universal arise? How do we get to the point where we can make claims to reality that are not connected to our upbringing and of course things like two plus two equals four right how do we get to a point where we can say that here we go this is now yeah. I'm com it's coming back to me yeah here we yeah. go yeah and it, like is two plus two equals four is that just an idea that will die with us or is that a reflection of something real or e equals mc squared is that is that a relative thing or does that tell us it's something a, it's about a theory reality of, it's a theory, a theory of, of relativity. relativity yes it is <laughs> 
No. So that uh, was the whole joke. Yeah, that was good. I like Thank that. Thank you. Yeah, very well done, sir. Snuck that one. <laughs> yeah, in. that's not going to be popular in the comedy scene, but you know, yeah, so, yeah. a certain small number of physicists would be a first will if like it. it was. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so Hegel, he tries to answer this. The basic question of how do you get to the point where thought and being are connected? And he ultimately, very, if I very briefly tell his story, it's almost like a child. A child starts, you could go like, we start with the unconscious, into consciousness, into self-consciousness. And that's what's called subjective spirit. So unconsciousness in this sense is not the Freudian unconscious. It's just the idea that the first experience we have as infants or a snail has of reality. Uh, is you get sensations. There's no you, there's no object, there's just sensations, and you could call that the unconscious. And that then becomes consciousness, and consciousness is where you start to realize there's a world. Yeah. Yeah, you start to grasp things. And then self-consciousness is when you grasp your consciousness as an object. Terrible day. Yes, yeah, yeah. Ugh. Because the moment, the day, whenever consciousness itself becomes an object. Ugh, awful. So that's self-consciousness. Then for Hegel, we move into what he calls objective spirit, which is the next stage is whenever, like a child, starts to learn that there are ethical commitments, things that, like, you can't just live the way you want. Right. Just, you know, not might is right. You can't just hate who you hate, love who you love, treat people in any way. There's a well, certain... I clearly haven't gotten to this stage yeah, yet. Yeah, you'll get there soon. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great. Uh, but, like, and that's called objective spirit because partly you feel, although it's within you, the the what's called the categorical imperative. There's a sense in which there's some things I shouldn't do even if I want to do them. That's something that you feel that's making a demand on you. And that goes through family. That's where you learn it. Family, civil society, and state. And then we get to absolute spirit, which is where a kid... I'm, I'm, by the way, I'm using the analogy of an individual, which is kind of just a, an easy way of thinking about it. But... Uh, is where you go to university and you learn things about science. Mm-hmm. You learn two plus two equals four. And that's absolute spirit. That's where thought and reality are intertwined. So Wonderful. basically what's happened is very gradually consciousness has uh, got to the point where it grasps something that's true. Um, okay, so mm-hmm. I feel like you prepared that part and you spoke it so eloquently (laughs) but i didn't follow i would love to hear the terms again because um i went through a lot very quickly you did and categorical and categorical imperative is cool sounding and i'd like to know more about that and i would like to know more about uh the uh stages that you talked about of going just run if you don't mind if you guys don't mind at home i would like that to be if you could just repeat literally everything you said verbatim. That oh, would yeah. <laughs> well, I'll yeah, do it very quickly. Is imagine for Hegel, it's almost like we start the unconscious. Then yes. it, it Un- grows. Truly unconscious. Yeah, truly unconscious. Like there's, there is this very, As very basic. an adjective, basic, not a noun. Yes. Yes. It's a, it's a, it's. it's noun a, being the Freudian unconscious. Yeah, and the Freudian unconscious Which being. Which not really be a noun, but it's, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think I'm following you in that. Well, like the, the unconscious here is just the very first experience of life. It's like what very basic organisms feel. Mm-hmm. So there's no, there's no subject or object. That's it. So it's unconscious. Babies. Yeah, babies. Infants. Like when you're born, there's feelings. My little nephew. Yeah. Explosions in their no, body, but, yeah. they, but no kind of way of organizing it mm-hmm. in the content. Yes. So that's the kind of, that's the, the abyssal unconscious. Yes. Being. Okay. Being which then groans and yearns for consciousness. So what happens is the infant, whenever they start to actually perceive things in the world, uh, they become conscious of objects in the world. That's the next stage. The unconscious becomes conscious. What do you think? Well, I was, I was going to give an aside because yeah. I want to hear the rest of this, and I am listening. Mm. Um, but 
uh, we're having a drink as well. We're having some yeah. gin and tonic. If you guys want to join along, please. And feel we, free. you know, this is not a lecture. This is it's a conversation. A lecture, it's it's a conversation. conversation. So don't we'll come decide. at me about interrupting Pete. That's <laughs> what I do. All right, and I do it because there's for every person that's like I interrupt Pete too much. There's a billion other people that are like I'm not following what Pete is saying, and I do mean billion other people. Yeah, yeah. Like, that's how big this podcast. Whatever, is. it's growing. It's I don't care. Massive. It's yeah. doing very well. Uh, it's doing very well. It's so doing that's okay. pretty cool. That's good. Yeah, it's doing yeah. pretty cool. Uh, but I got a Christmas present for uh, my brother and sister-in-law for my nephew. I've never had a nephew before, yeah, yeah. Um, a biological nephew, I guess. Um, but he uh, is a tiny thing. He's a little mm-hmm. nugget. And I, I got him um, some a, a onesie that says a few yeah. things. Uh, and Well, some onesies that say a few things. One is a bib that just says, uh, what is it? Uh, one is a bib that says this again, no. which is pretty funny. But I got him a onesie that just has the words, I don't even know who I am. Oh, perfect. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Because I was like yeah. a baby who's either laughing or crying, but wearing a onesie that says, I don't even know who I am, to me was one of the funniest thing <laughs> that I, is I've, brilliant uh, and i gave out christmas like this is what i guess it's it's crap i, I ironed it on but it, i think it's wonderful so that yeah so i did a hegelian uh uh subliminal message that's to my it nephew. because so because unconsciousness it has consciousness in it but like in a very primordial way just, yeah it's just a thing just, just a thing i don't know but it eventually, it, the, the kind of the antagonism gets bigger and bigger until consciousness erupts out of unconscious. The baby doesn't know who it is in consciousness, it, but it starts to know there's a world. So I have a nephew, and whenever you put on now a bit of bougie yeah, uh, of a, you know, a comic face on your phone, right. he loves it. Because it's because he can identify it as an object in the world. He can read it. Super easy to read a uh-huh. cartoon face, and he's so now he's he's actually identifying things in the world. That's yeah. consciousness. And then comes out of that because there's a out of, there's a there's an implicit self consciousness because there's a receiver of what's happening. Self consciousness is whenever you become conscious of your consciousness, you become conscious of you as a receiver of things. So that's self consciousness. So those are the first three stages. That's subjective spirit. Does that sound, how does that sound? Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Subjective I, spirit. Okay. Yeah. Subjective spirit. Um, I am nothing. I am me. Oh, I am me against the, I am me separate from everything yeah. else. It's I almost am. like, it's almost like there's no me or not. There's just, a, 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 it's like taking a very heavy MDMA or something. You just, there's just experience mm-hmm. that's unconscious. Then there's, oh, there's stuff. And then there's, oh, I I, I am here experiencing stuff. Those are yeah. three. Yeah. Um, now, that's all very messy in real life, but I'm just simplifying. Yep. I like it. I think yep. you're doing a great job thus far. Yeah. So the next stage is objective spirit. And this is where you start to feel. And by the way, this is all going on inside your head, right? Because philosophers always start with inside your head. You don't presuppose the existence of anything. Just, just in your head. Mm-hmm. I think therefore I am. Yeah. That's the yeah, Cartesian thing, yeah. So that's very, very philosophical. Mm-hmm. Some, um, the next stage is, as a child, you kind of start to learn that I have to be nice to my siblings. I have to be nice to my parents, right? In other words, and you internalize that. You start to feel like, you know, might is right ethics is where you can just do whatever you want. I might is right if I'm stronger than you, I'll just do whatever I want. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. And the child eventually learns and experiences uh, something that stops them from doing that. That's the categorical imperative, mm-hmm. right? This demand that we all feel that there's certain things we shouldn't do. Super ego. Yes, yeah, super ego is connected. That's kind of this the voice of society. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's the categorical imperative is maybe even more basic than that, but but that's it. The super ego comes out of the categorical imperative. Gotcha. Um, and there's three of stages. There's family. Because you start off by caring about your family, but you don't give a shit about anybody else. Then civil society, if you're, you know, if you're growing well, you'll start to care about the people outside your family and eventually the state. (laughs) If you're not a psychopath. If you're not a psychopath. And then eventually you care about your neighbor, which is the enemy, the the person who's not like you. Yeah. And that's when you get into the, you care about your 
neighbor, your enemy, the, uh, the, the thing that you don't understand. Yes, that's where, and you, and it's objective spirit because your neighbor, even if your neighbor's just in your head, is other than you, there's something that is making a demand that is saying, do not murder me. Uh, Emmanuel Levin says that, that the face of the other always says, do not murder me. Uh-huh. It's like, there's something that I have to, I don't have to obey, but I feel it. If I disobey it. Isn't that I interesting? Yeah. yeah. And that's really interesting. We're a weird little <laughs> organism, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> and that's objective spirit. Okay. And then finally, we get into what Hegel talks about as art, religion, and philosophy, and their absolute spirit. That's where our thoughts begin to actually describe mm-hmm. the way reality is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And when All you right. get to that point, then we have got to this point where thought and being intertwine. Our thinking and reality are one. Now, this is a very, it's a very difficult, that's the journey of consciousness. I mean, I'm a big fan of this last part. Right. Yeah. I like it so far. Mm. But I mean, are you saying you, that your thought influences reality? Ah, that's a, you know, when you get to the end point, Hegel would probably say that you realize that you are the universe thinking itself. Well, enough about Hegel, Pete. What do you think? Yeah, well, I would say that. that I would say that we are... The reason why thought and being connect uh-huh. is because uh, we are the universe thinking itself. So our thought... And reality okay. have the same texture. We did do the right call by letting this be the podcast. Is that, yeah, yeah. This is much more systematic than our. I like the way we, I like when we agree more than when we uh, yeah. fight and I know it was, it's scream upsetting. at each other yeah. and get so upset. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah. and this is in contrast to what C.S. Lewis calls bulverism, which is the idea that bulverism. He he made up a figure. He said. He said, there's a worldview that's so prevalent in the 20th century, but you can't pin it down to a thinker because no thinker really thinks this. But it's the, the idea that everything we believe is connected to the sociology of knowledge. It's all connected to, to, to how we were brought up. So he, he invents a figure. He says, this guy, Ezekiel Bulver. And Ezekiel Bulver, when he was a kid, so his parents argue, and his hus- uh, the, the, the husband or the wife said to the other, you just think that because you're a man, or you just think that because you're a woman. And Ezekiel Bulver went, that's right. We only think things because of our position in society. Mm-hmm. And so he calls it Bulverism. Yeah, that's some hilarious stuff mm. that I wish uh, I, I or one of my more talented contemporaries would have come up with but the fact that c.s lewis did it on his own yeah. is of course wonderful and also c.s the whole history of c.s lewis uh with working alongside tolkien and the sort of creative circle that they had where they would kind of throw things out and then tolkien was like quietly working on this giant Lupus, yeah. mythology that they were like yeah no keep doing that it's <laughs> so crazy and yeah. that it be- and i rewatched the lord of the rings um, like six weeks ago, uh, and it's, I mean, I'm not going to read the books. I'm not a nerd, but like, it's so good. Like, yeah. it's so great. And C.S. Lewis is another example, uh, it was a friend and they're, they're coming up with these things and like screw tape letters is still on my yeah. shelf. And I love screw tape letters. I love the idea that this dude was like, I'm going to make up this idea of a demon and I'm going to write letters as a demon. Yeah. That kind of stuff is just like. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Like give it like, it's so fun. It's so silly and it's so out there and it's done with such confidence that when you read it, you're like, Oh shit, this dude's speaking like some real truth. Like this is some genius stuff. Even if I don't necessarily agree with, uh, he went a little, didn't he go, he got, he got suit cause he became the father of apologetics, like the father of, of Christian apologetics. Yeah. It's a, it's a really interesting story. Like CS Lewis is fascinating. I, he's not as good as some religious people think he is, and he's not as bad as some other people well, think he is. Like he's religious people, he is the smartest. Yeah, yeah, being yes. I mean, he was <laughs> definitely very smart. He got his double first, I think, from Oxford, and um, yeah, he's very smart. But he's not like yeah. Uh, I I um I did a festival about him, and I read literally everything. You did, he did a festival him. about him. Yeah, what was that about? What yeah. was it called? It was called oh. I forget what it was called, but it was in Belfast, and because he's a Belfast man, yeah, I grew up just around the corner from yeah. from where he grew up, and and 
I think there's so much interesting stuff in this work. So we had the the whole thing in the place he had his honeymoon with Joy, and cool. it, and it overlooks the forest that inspired Narnia, and so there's all of this interesting history in the place that we did it. Well, do you think you would like him as much if you didn't grow up around the corner from where he? I don't know. Maybe not. I don't know. know. Maybe not. But he was maybe a very you're good just writer. A product of yeah. how you grew up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's and this is that this is important yet yeah, to. The, re the reason why actually, uh, his essay on Bulverism is really interesting, but the reason why I would slightly disagree with it is, is that well, the, Hegel is attempting to show that we are all products of where we grew up, but we eventually, gradually, through very hard work, we can transcend it. So, but, well, so Pete, the universal yeah, comes out of a particular with What? Was that? What did you say? Oh, yeah. So the, the universal arises out of the particular. We eventually, through hard work, if if we do philosophy or whatever, science, we get to the point where we can make real claims about reality. Yeah. That transcend our prejudices. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Isn't that good news? Mm -hmm. That's great news, mm -hmm. right? Like for people who are like, uh uh, I mean, I feel a little bit in my life like there's a smorgasbord of beliefs and ideas that you can take from. And it's so fun to do the thing of like, well, I believe parts of this and this because it keeps everyone happy. Like oh, yeah, if you yeah. can be like, I believe a little bit of this, I, of course, and I believe, and but I don't really know. And, but it allows you to not take a stand for anything. So when I hear stuff like that, that Hegel is saying that you can yeah. transcend this particularity or what, what, what did you call it? Particular? Yeah. Yep. Transcend the particularity. Yeah. And you can land on solid ground. So you're saying as a philosopher that there is objective truth you can land on. Yes. Yes. But yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the buts is, but the problem I'm is... I'm so glad you're doing the majority of the talking on this because right. I've already had like two beers before this and you gave me a gin, so I'm just like, yeah, keep I know, talking. But I, you know, as it makes, it makes it dry. If I'm the one talking, it's dry, you know, so... You I know. know what the people want. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so, the, pro one of, so the, the problem with someone like Stalin, right, is it Here Stalin... Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> is Name it, one. Name yeah, one, right. There's one problem with Stalin, right? One of the issues with Stalin was he wrote this famous paper on dialectics. The problem is he saw himself as standing outside it. He saw himself, and this is always a problem with the left, the, a, a potential danger of the left is, and it's called progressivism, um, is the danger as it's described today, the ideology of today, is progressivism has a sense of where things are going. It kind of knows where things should be, right? And you, so there's a, we know where, where, where it's going to land. Yeah. So this is a very Stalinist notion because whenever you know where it's going to land, you can sacrifice things, right? If, if, you're, if you're an instrument of history, if you, have a, mm -hmm. if you have like a privileged insight into the universal, you know where everything's going, then you go, right, we can do whatever it takes to get there. Hegel says something slightly different. Hegel says the universal arises gradually. So you, you only can know how the universal is erupting in the present. You don't know where it's going. You, but so he talks about the, he says the oil of Minerva spreads her wings at dusk. What? The oil of Minerva. Oil? Oil. It's the Northern Irish accent. O-W-L. O-W-L? <laughs> oh, I thought you were talking about olive oil. I was no. like, what? How now, Brian Kai? The oil. owl? The owl. The owl. <laughs> <laughs> I can't right. say it. Owl. It Good sounds Lord. weird when I say You say Malou. It you know sounds many, weird. You oh. know how many things you've probably said that people have the totally wrong idea of because they thought you were talking about a refrigerator and <laughs> you were talking about something totally different? Okay. <laughs> well, so the, the owl, owl. owl of Nerva spreads her wings at dusk. Yes. The yeah. Uh, yeah. Which is philosophy understands backwards. Philosophy looks at what's going on and it, and, it, and it understands. So it's moving forwards, but you don't really know where it's going. So the universal for Hegel is always erupting. You're always discovering truth. You're always mm -hmm. moving towards it. But if you start to think you know where everything's going, then you're in danger. Mm -hmm. So kind of, it sounds weird, but it's like the universal is constantly arising. It's where it's a struggle. And we're learning more and discovering more. Supervenience? 
supervenience. I don't know that term. Um, that? Oh, supersessionist? No. S- no. Uh, and then um, I'm throwing out some terms. Go for it. That I've heard that I forgot. You know, mm. when you read something and you're like, hold on to this for the podcast. <laughs> uh, it, the idea of um, emergence, theory of emergence, oh, yeah. uh, different layers that, that can supervene on one another in a causal ways that are unpredictable yes that's very that emergence theory is very key yes cp i've read yeah so it's it's almost weirdly like it's destiny is always in the past so there's this contingent movement in the in the future to the towards the future yeah uh but we can kind of look into the past and make uh we can see basically we can see how the universal is gradually arising what do you do though when you see the patterns over and over again yeah. and you see the ways that they play out it's a very hard task to be like we don't know what's going to happen this time we don't know what's going to happen in the future yeah. even though we've seen this shit a million times mm. and it constantly plays out the same way so it's like but that's different than i think what you're talking about what you're talking about is something beyond that and you can use history to of course Prob- d- deduce with probability what's going to happen in yeah. the future and and the ultimate truth whatever that means yeah the and the ultimate truth for hegel what he calls absolute knowledge is where you realize that the, tr- the truth is dialectics is the contra is the movement itself so you but you can land on some truth besides just arguing yeah. you can like yeah but the truth you can land so for example right marx is a hegelian so when marx does uh looks critiques capitalism his main thing is like what is the contradiction that exists in the in the economics right and if we just see the contradiction just seeing it just look at it just look at it hey just bring it to the surface there it is and yeah and that that will change it that's a very hegelian thing now marx wasn't fully hegelian so he so he he um gave into the temptation of utopia a couple of times but but he oh, marks at his best what a devil yeah <laughs> this idea that we could uh there's a line in um from god's perspective by the philosopher bo burnham where uh he says uh uh couldn't life on earth be like heaven isn't just the thought of it worth a try oh i remember seeing that yeah, yeah. that was that was a very good that was an hour long special yeah. he did when he was really young yeah. I don't know if he's... it's it's upsetting. Yeah, it's it's it makes you think about certain things. It makes me think about certain things about the the ways that um, people can do such incredible works of art at such a young age, yeah. uh, and it stands the test of time. And I still listen to that song and that special "What" by Bo Burnham is, is yeah. incredible. I when I watched that, I was like, I think this is a moment of genius, and I'm kind mm-hmm. of almost worried for him that. He'll never he, reach that point and he again. Knew it. He's, he uh, was self aware enough to know that he he, was he, a he hit on something. It was a genius move. It's like whenever a mathematician or a philosopher early on hits on something that yeah. they can never get back to. It was when I, the first time I saw that special, I w- I remember laying on carpet on just with a pillow, be like crying and being like, "This is there's I can only hope in my lifetime to do yeah. something as good as what he did." Yeah. Um, it's an inspiration. It's, just, it's, it's something to keep in mind. How to do it. like, and it was you put me onto it. You show, you said watch this, yeah, watch this. and I was like, um, oh my god, that was very Jeez. impressive. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, the age doesn't even yeah. affect me. It's just the sheer quality of it is so. But anyway, yeah. yeah anyway, yeah, yeah. How do you um, know anything? So, uh, so Hegel, you're yeah. you're leaning into Hegel here. I am. I am. I because I'm a I'm a Hegelian. Now, what would be for the sake of the podcast and the conversation, what would be like the opposite view? Like what would be the critique if we're talking about dialectics that oh, yeah. the truth itself is within the contradiction? What would be the contradiction to the Hegelian view of epistemology? Okay, that's very good. Yes, yeah, so a few oppositions, right? So some people might want to argue with Immanuel Kant that that ultimate reality is unknowable mm-hmm. that language cannot penetrate to reality and so you would say can't, but you would probably say can't even didn't believe that well no i think can't did but yeah this is funny because this is part of the discussion we had right. in the podcast that didn't go out um is it so can't right can't is really interesting one of the greatest philosophers he argued as you know because you've been reading Kant, 
he argued that um, we, we can't know ultimate reality, but we can know what he called a synthetic a priori, which is we can, we can know things, we can have a basis for science, we can have knowledge of how things work, but it falls short of uh, the action. penetration into reality itself. So yeah, so he, he, he talked about the There's Lumina. no relationship between the outside world and your telescope in your brain of what you can see, right? Like you can get kind of a, uh, an accurate glimpse of it, but you're not really a part of it. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's weird. Right? So yeah, he, cause he, like he wanted to, and this is the bad reading of Kant. This is what we're talking about. By the way, day. Kant was what? 1500, 1600, something like that. 16. I hope I'm always bad. 16, 17, 17, yeah. maybe. Yeah. So 1700s, I think. Okay. Uh, so 18th century. Um, but I might be a bit wrong, but he was basically just before he had Enlightenment era. Yes. Uh, yeah. He's kind of like, he's like the birth of the enlightenment yeah. actually is Kant. And the bad reading of Kant is that Kant is a subjectivist. That Kant is the one who says we don't have access to reality. We, and so he's the birth of postmodernism, all that stuff. But Kant's actually trying to overcome that. Kant wants to say, yes, we can't know whether God exists or whether the universe uh, has a it's beginning a and all of that. Yeah, or is a simulation. We can't just don't have access to that. But what we can know is uh, things like E equals MC squared. We can make claims as to how reality functions but we can't know what it is in itself and then so there's people who say that that's called epistemological humility mm -hmm. where a lot of religious people will say that is you can't know the mind of god right you can't know the, oh, the mystery the, yeah. yeah the mystery and Love then that. and then there's some people who would say that um, and this is the new age response not response <laughs> the new age approach is that uh, there's a holism, everything is one. There is no contradiction. The contradiction is just an illusion. Um, everything is uh, interconnected in a balance. One of my least favorite things about Jung is the influence that has been, I guess, ascribed to him, and for, for good reason, of the New Age movement mm -hmm. that has purported that i guess there is a wholeness a oneness a ultimate um balance utopia that mm -hmm. is achievable if you can get just get rid of all your thoughts just get rid of all that clutter just get yeah, rid yeah, of all yeah. those things and just become one with the universe uh it bothers me i don't feel like that's what he was aiming at and i don't feel like it's uh true but because at the core, I do think is a contradiction. I think that if anything, there's a contradiction there. That is a insolvable. Like it, you can't get past certain. Uh, anyway, that's my, yeah, yeah. my take on the whole thing. A hundred percent. And this is why I'm excited about you going deep into Jung I'm because in there. yeah, Jung needs to be either rescued from that or developed out of that. Because that s certain people have taken him in that direction, and that's not potentially good for him um but i think there's an element of that in him but it's probably also an element that of that that's not in him uh yeah there yeah. is an element of that in him that is like like point blank like he i think would have leaned that way yeah. at times but um also i would say speaking of not good for him he's been getting a lot of work lately do you know about this no what's this he made an appearance he's gotten cast in a pixar film Oh, wow, I didn't know this. Yeah, wow, okay. a Pixar film. That's yeah. one of the, they're a hugely popular production company. Yeah. And uh, Carl Jung, uh, it was cast in the recent Pixar film, Soul. Um, so it's a speaking a, role. A person called Carl Jung or Carl, Carl Jung? Carl Jung with a mustache. Who is in the Pixar? In the, uh, in the Pixar no film, way. Soul. And I tell you, oh, if people keep recommending this to me. I should re watch this. Oh, thing. you're gonna hate it. It's I know, so I, I it's feel so bad because people recommend, and I'm like, oh, I know, I'm maybe you're gonna, not gonna. You're gonna, you should like <laughs> it, but you won't. I, and I, I no, know. it is really good. <laughs> but uh, I was on a plane because my my dear sweet mom came up with an idea to do like a movie recommendation thing where the family all recommends movies and we all watch it. 
I don't know if she's watched Soul yet, but all the kids have. And because my brother messaged me, and he was like, "Carl Jung makes a cameo." And, yeah, yeah. and I was like, "Are you kidding me?" I was like, "That's so weird." Carl Jung makes a, a little uh, joke in it, and yeah. he makes a joke that's not appropriate, that's not uh, in line with his psychology, but it's yeah. a very sweet joke, and he's in it. Like it's so cool. That's very like, good. Carl Jung of all people in yeah. a Pixar movie. Who would think it? Anyway, I'm gonna have to watch it. Yeah, I really detour the conversation just to get around to talking about soul for a second but. Well, and, and here's the thing here's my argument for why okay so some people think everything is one some people think everything is multiple hegel says everything is not one yeah. every the, the one is not one which is a does not equal a which means like if a equals a if there's no contradiction in reality there is no time because time is nothing but entropy time is 100%. nothing but the measurement of change and so as far as i can see one has to assume that reality is in a type of war with itself i think it's just it just has to be the, the case but um but but it takes a long time to see that we're getting to the season this it feels like the season finale, the season finale of the yeah. fundamentalists <laughs> like, are we coming we're landing on a cosmological uh mm -hmm. purpose for uh yeah i mean time if yeah. you want we should have a whole episode on, on time yeah, yeah on time yeah because it is a, a creepy um time is creepy the whole idea of the, the physics and the theory of relativity and super string theory and all that stuff and how time does warp it, it, it it's a little weird. Yeah, yeah. It's a little uncomfortable for me to, to, to really wrap my head around, and it reminds me only of my place in this, my speckness in the universe. So that's my yeah. diatribe on that. But anyway, what can we know and how do we know it? How okay. does the average Joe, Pete, know to that they can land on truth. And also, here's another thing. H yeah. Hegel, in seeing this contradiction, other people think there's no contradiction. Yeah. So there's a contradiction between the no contradiction and the contradiction. And then, so, so some people say there's no contradiction. Some people say we can't know either way. And Hegel says we can, right? So those are th the three broad positions. And, and Hegel's saying that like, contradiction is the end point. Like, it is always going to be contradicted. There's always going to be a... Uh, uh, never-ending barrage of unsolvable problems. Yes. That cool. kind of gets That's deeper fun. and deeper and deeper until the insight that it's it's part of reality itself, which you could say, you know, we've talked about it before, but mathematics has got there with the... Um, uh, with Gödel's kind of incompleteness theorem. I don't know what that is. Yeah, which well, is really fascinating. So in mathematics, Gödel basically has a proof that shows that mathematics works on axioms, basic axioms that produce results, mm -hmm. but that mathematics can't justify its own axioms. When it tries to uh, prove, it. prove its own axioms, it falls into contradiction. And some people would say that just shows that mathematics doesn't isn't explain there reality. Yet. Yeah, or doesn't explain reality or isn't there yet. But the more radical position is to say, no, it is there. It shows that that contradiction is hard baked into reality mm -hmm. itself. And then of course in physics, you've mm -hmm. got wave particle geology. And then I, we've talked about it before, but democracy mm -hmm. is, is um, a type of uh, contradiction within the social body where like differences that can't be reconciled creates forward momentum for society. Oh, so cool. you know? uh, Evolution but is the biological name for it. There is forward momentum though. Mm. Like even Hegel would say you do transcend the participate or the uh particular you do you can't go to a more universal thing so there is growth that can happen there is yep. a sort of evolution as you would say that can happen as a result of these clashings yes it's kind of like a it's a it's a it's a forward and backwards motion so in psychoanalysis say someone has problems with being sick and digestion that's a very common thing right so someone has a problem with they're throwing up all the time doctors can't find out why and then through psychoanalysis, they discover that there's something that they can't digest within their thinking, mm -hmm. something they haven't been able to metabolize, be able to put into words. And it's partly connected to their job. It's partly connected to some trauma in their workplace. But then that connects with the trauma connected to when they were children. Mm -hmm. And then that connects with the trauma that is being itself. So what's happening in, in that? And, but by the way, every time you overcome 
So you, whenever you realize that you can't digest something in your life, you, you're no longer sick, right? So you overcome that contradiction of your body. Mm -hmm. And then you overcome, you overcome. So you're moving forwards, but yet you're also just moving deeper and deeper and deeper into more and more intractable problems until you, you get to the most intractable of issues, which is death itself. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I mean, it's fine. I yeah. Know you die. You die. Uh, it's not that big of a deal. You uh, know, funny, that it's not that big of a deal when you don't like life. That's the funny thing. It's like the problem is ma imagine we all start liking life. Then, then death becomes a real issue. It becomes a real fucking headache, right? And mm -hmm. and that's and that's ahead of us. That's why she's ex says, "Don't worry, we we'll, we have more problems ahead." It's like if we start to enjoy our lives, then then it, we overcome one contradiction, like alienation in the workplace, but then we encounter another contradiction. Yep, over and over again. Yeah, I'm a big fan of a podcast, and I won't tell you what it's about, but the title is "This Union Life," and it is they're great. <laughs> uh, but they were they used a term that I really liked. They were talking about the QAnon uh, conspiracy, and truth, uh, all truth, uh, hundred percent. Uh, that is truth. Hmm. But uh, they were talking about how there's almost a casual. Oh, by the way, the funny thing is, there's always truth in conspiracy. There's a, not not in the content, but in the form. But anyway, keep exactly. going. Yeah, yeah. well, mm. yeah, you, yeah, exactly. Uh, but there's a the term that they use that I really liked, and I think it describes a lot of what I've experienced in my upbringing in the South is a casual suicidality, or a casual uh, cat you being casually suicidal. Like there is a sort of um, ugh your time to go your time to go you know mm. like when it takes me it takes me it's time to go when it's your time to go it's your you know uh, i'm gonna do this i'm gonna go out i'm gonna not i'm not gonna wear a mask i'm not gonna do that you know because you know what if it happens it happens it's hey it's no big deal if it's god's time to take me and it's my time to go to heaven i'm gonna go mm. and it always is wrapped around this idea that death is not that big of a deal and in actuality is the opposite it's actually wonderful like oh my god just bring me death like just kill me like if mm. only like it like just die and it's like oh that's a little suicide that's a little suicidal that's a little cool way to be like i would rather be dead uh yeah yeah that is that is interesting we should do an episode on death anyway any takeaways any any thoughts on what time or how are we doing yeah, that's perfect yeah we're or did you right have a, did you have any other thoughts no i forgot what we're talking about um <laughs> Uh, theory of knowledge um yeah i mean i think you can know things that's my big takeaway right. I, I would have said that before i don't have any grounds to speak about it in regards to he hegel or anything but i think you can have a certain i actually here's my big takeaway mm -hmm. more of a prediction i think that in terms of where we are at in the scope of our existence as a species we may be closer to knowing a lot more very soon but i could be wrong because in the at the end of the day, well, do you think aliens are going to tell us? I might think a lot of things. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? Rattle around in here, but uh, I, I think that we will figure some stuff out very soon. Only because I don't believe there's some utopia we're going to get to, but the, I think there is enough contradiction currently happening in different areas that will amount to a result that is beyond what anyone could ever possibly predict. Yeah. What that looks like, I don't know, but I think that the search and the journey is what's important, and I hope everyone continues to try to find, uh, to just keep keep doing things. I think yeah. that's the, I mean, that's the whole goal of the podcast, right? Is to get people to go out and engage with life and engage with their contradictions, the stuff yep. that challenges them. Uh, what do you got? Oh yeah. Just, I guess, similar to you, like when I was younger, I was probably more drawn by the idea of epistemological humility. The idea that there's, that we don't have access to reality, but the deeper I went into philosophy, the more I was like, actually, I think that we are the universe understanding itself. And that means that we are, and it's very beautiful. It means that it's we beautiful. human beings are like, instead of just like floating around and we die and um, we're, we don't really have much of a purpose, it's like, oh my goodness, we are the universe over 14 billion years striving and yearning to come to an understanding of itself. And we play this small part in that cosmic self-understanding of the universe and i think it's very very beautiful 
and um, I think that it's philosophically justifiable to think that. Wow, that's beautiful, and it bums me out because it's I have nothing to disagree with there. I think it's so beautiful. Yeah, there you go. Uh, that's uh, and I also would extend it. I would say the only thing I would add is yeah. that it probably extends to each individual, which is a pretty cool way to go through life. Going, oh, okay, so that's my joke. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah, I think Very it's good. good. So let's have another drink and uh, Bye, say everybody. goodbye to everybody. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Great episode, Pete. Let's post this one. <laughs> yeah, let's do it.